Hello, this is Corey Hill, and I work at the Partnership for People with Disabilities at Virginia Commonwealth University. I want to thank you all for joining us for our May Talks on Tuesday, Ditch the Animal Sound, Writing Appropriate Outcomes that Lead to an Effective Implementation. Thank you all for joining us. I am delighted to welcome Dr. Corey Hurd Cassidy. Corey did our March Talks on Tuesday, and this is part two of that webinar. She's going to talk a little bit about some steps she took in between as far as working with us on the blog. But Corey has been a longtime early interventionist and a friend to EI and my friend as well. And I know Corey will tell you she's suffering a little bit from a cold, um, so just bear with her as she gets through it. But Corey, thank you again for joining us, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Corey. Well, there I am on the screen uh, in a little bit of a glamour shot. Um, I definitely do not look like that today. As Corey said, I have a little bit of a cold, but I'm still thrilled to be here with all of you today and, and want to thank everybody for joining us today on this beautiful day. I know you'd love to be probably be outside. Um, so let me back up for just a minute. On March 3rd this, of this year, I was honored to present a talk on Tuesday webinar, as Corey mentioned, entitled, It's Almost Never Apraxia, Understanding Appropriate Diagnoses of Speech and in Early Intervention. And that webinar addressed appropriate diagnoses of speech sound disorders in infants and toddlers. Many of you participated in that webinar as well, and I want to welcome you back today. In follow-up to that webinar, I've also written four blog posts on the Integrated Training Collaborative Professional Development Team website. The training specialists and I all appreciate that many of you took the time to participate in that March webinar as well as on the blogs. And I want to thank you for keeping us on our toes with your fantastic feedback in the form of both comments and questions. And we hope that you continue to ask those questions um, on the blog as those, are, as those um, continue to be live and, and ready for your feedback. So this webinar today is a part two to that first session back in March. So today we'll briefly review assessment and diagnostic considerations related to articulation and phonology. I discussed this more thoroughly in the second of the four blog posts. So again, you're welcome to go back and review those. But I want to be sure to review the information briefly for those of you who did not have the opportunity to read or participate in that forum. I'm also going to focus today on what is and is not appropriate in regard to outcomes, and we'll discuss the best ways to incorporate speech sound development within our outcomes with families. And finally, I'll present strategies to facilitate appropriate and natural speech sound development within everyday activities and routines. So to ensure that you'll enjoy and learn from today, you're going to need a few things. The first thing you'll want is something to write on. And, or something to write with, I should say, and anything will do. Something to write on as well, preferably on something that you can read. And then we also want you to bring your own ideas and questions to share with others. So feel free to go ahead and ask questions on the chat room to make comments as we go along, and I'll try to catch those as we proceed. So if you did not have the opportunity to participate in the March webinar or in the blog discussions, as I mentioned before, they are archived and they're still open to the public. So I encourage you to go back following today's webinar to watch the March webinar, but also to read through the blogs and to provide comments and questions and even feedback. So in getting started today then, what are the basic considerations that we want to keep in mind when working with an infant or toddler in regard to speech sound development? Typically, a speech-language pathologist, or an SLP, will diagnose an articulation or phonological disorder if a child is demonstrating a delay of at least 6 to 12 months in regard to the production of certain sounds or patterns, based on the age at which mastery of those sounds is expected. So unless we consistently observe a toddler demonstrating the red flags that you see on the screen, including initial sound deletions, distortion or consistent difficulty with vowels, or deletion of lots of sounds. So maybe the child uses only one or two consonant sounds consistently or at all. We really should not be diagnosing an articulation or phonological disorder prior to the age of three years. Now again, since most of the speech sounds are still developing and the phonological processes that we monitor, and we will be monitoring them, are still expected to be present in a child's verbalizations until the age of three or older, we really do just want to monitor those patterns in a child's words and phrases until they're three years old. 
Now, parents will often come to us, you've all had this situation, with concerns about their child's intelligibility and speech skills because the parents have difficulty understanding the messages that their children are trying their very hardest to convey. As an SLP then, my first goal with a toddler in regard to speech and language development would be to conduct a comprehensive communication assessment by collecting a speech and language sample. So within this play-based sample, I would listen for those three speech-related red flags that I just reviewed. But ultimately, above and beyond my observations regarding the child's speech productions, I would assess whether he or she is using the language skills that are developmentally expected for his or her age. Toddlers who are extremely difficult to understand are often still using a lot of jargon when they speak because they lack vocabulary or have difficulty with grammatical markers or struggle to put words together into phrases. All of these are skills that are actually expected by two years of age. And we typically expect that jargon, which can be defined as babbling with intent, will begin to fade at about 18 months and completely dissipate by 24 months, by two years. So if a toddler has an expressive language delay or disorder, his intelligibility will certainly be affected as he will often continue to use a lot of that jargon well beyond the time at which he should be subsiding in use of that jargon in lieu of words. So instead of recognizing that the jargon is a substitute for real words or grammar that should have developed, we often misinterpret the jargon to be speech sound production errors. So I want to be clear here that I'm not advocating for fewer services for infants or toddlers. If we're working with children who are extremely difficult to understand or for whom speech and language do not seem to be developing appropriately or as expected, we should absolutely be working with these kids. But I am advocating that the services we provide to these children and their families should be functional. So what do I mean by that? Functional services will be based on appropriate diagnoses of the young children with whom we work. These kids definitely do need services, but when we're diagnosing appropriately and accurately, our services for infants and toddlers will be based on the diagnosis of a language disorder versus a speech sound disorder. We should therefore be focusing, providing services that focus on language development rather than on speech sound development. Or better yet, we should be providing best practices by coaching families to facilitate speech sound development within rather than separate from outcomes and activities that target functional communication by and with the child. So that's ultimately what we're going to talk about today. So keeping this in mind now, I want to keep you on your toes, so I want to hear from you. Should we even be including specific speech sound development in our outcomes for infants and toddlers? So that's the question, yes or no. I want you to go ahead and practice using that chat feature to answer simply yes or no. Should we include specific speech sound production, specific speech sounds, in our outcomes for infants and toddlers? What do you all think? Thank you, Jennifer, for starting us off. Jennifer says no. Corey's put up the question for us, should we include specific speech sounds in our outcomes? I see some no's. Okay, Chesapeake folks say yes if it's a desired outcome for the family. Okay, so we're going to talk about that. And Carrie, thank you for saying you're not sure. Anybody else want to take a gander at this? Okay, Prince William. Yeah, it might depend on the circumstances. So we've got a couple of different answers here. So I'm going to tell you what I think. I would say that the answer is no and yes. So we're constantly talking about the fact that IFSP outcomes should be functional, but should we be writing outcomes that target specific speech sounds? Or, for example, address the production of animal sounds? Or focus on a toddler's ability to imitate environmental sounds? We actually still see outcomes that are often focused on the production of animal sounds or vehicle sounds or silly sounds. And we SLPs honestly tend to go in that direction as well because typically developing children, again, typically developing children, pick up on those sounds with ease. Parents and caregivers make books and play with animal sounds a lot of fun. And in turn, children tend to imitate them. 
Okay, so I recently had a discussion with my mom about this very thing. Now I know that sounds sort of silly. What you're seeing on the screen now is a handful of photos of my mom with her grandchildren. That's my niece, um, Allison Grace, and that's my son, Augie or August. Um, and so my mom actually is also an SLP. She has over 40 years of experience. She doesn't like me to tell people that, but it's very impressive to me. Um, and those 40 years are primarily working with young children and their families. So she and I have had some fantastic debates over the years. She really is a mentor to me, and I value and respect her opinion and the work that she's done. I used to observe all the time. I shadowed her. It's really how I became an SLP myself. But she was upset with me recently that I was telling her to stop using animal sounds in her practice with her toddlers and preschoolers. Now again, that was her interpretation. She reported that for most of the children with whom she worked, and she does do a lot of early intervention now. She's supposed to be retired, but that's never really going to happen. That for most of these children, she incorporates books and toys with farm animals and pets into her interactions. And that these, these um, incorporations, these interactions are natural, they're easy, and they're fun. So it sounds like all of the right ingredients. She argued that these activities in which she modeled the sounds and then matched them to the animals caught most children's attention and provided her with an opportunity to address sounds in play. And you know what? I mean, I can't disagree with that. I totally agree with her. She's right. And that makes sense. And it probably makes sense to most of you who are participating on this webinar today. But I want to take this out of the context of intervention, which is what she and I were discussing, and put it back into the context of functional outcomes. So when I explain to her that the message I'm trying to convey and what I truly believe is that when we're working with a child who's really struggling to get his or her basic needs or wants met because they, the child does not have the language, focusing specifically on and teaching a child to produce a bunch of animal sounds is really not a functional choice. So a child learns to moo or meow. Does that really help him get a drink of milk or call his mom when he needs her? While those sounds can certainly be fun, and for most children they really do grab their attention and make them smile, and many of them they will imitate eventually. But what about those children who don't have any language? As outcomes, animal sounds, environmental sounds, and silly sounds are really just not functional. So think about this for just a minute. Is the family's goal for this child really to produce animal sounds? or to imitate the sound of an airplane, or a car engine, or a choo-choo train. And I think we can all agree that that is not the ultimate outcome or goal for the family, for that child. So what does this mean to us? Let's go ahead and put this together. When we work with young children who are struggling with language development, they certainly need to be able to produce sounds in order to produce words. What is functional then is to address a child's ability to obtain needs and wants by learning how to label desired objects or to make a verbal request. These are functional outcomes. In order to request a drink or to ask for more or to label the boots that a little boy wants to wear to play in the snow, he needs to be able to produce an approximation of the words milk and more and boots. And so while the outcome itself is not to produce the M or the B sound specifically, the production of these sounds can and should certainly be embedded into the intervention itself. So when I followed up with my mom and we talked more about this, we talked about how the things that she was doing are cer certainly steps to work toward these outcomes. But the ultimate goal or outcome for this child is not to be producing those sounds in isolation or in animal sounds or in environmental sounds. So let's take a few minutes then to consider what outcomes might be functional for a child who presents with an expressive language delay or disorder. When working with toddlers, I recommend that early expressive language outcomes begin with the production of single words from different semantic or vocabulary. That's what we're talking about. Our, our, us SLPs love to use big words like semantics. We're really just talking about basic vocabulary here. Different categories such as nouns, verbs, prepositions, and adjectives in order to facilitate the child's expression of different ideas. So how we select the target words should be based on typical vocabulary development in addition to child's interests, family priorities, and everyday opportunities to use and practice these words. We really want to choose vocabulary that can be naturally embedded by the family into the child's and family's everyday routines and activities. 
Nouns are considered words of substance because they tend to specify particular objects. So these targets may include names of favorite foods or favorite toys or even pets. So I want to involve you guys again for just a few minutes. Let's brainstorm and come up with a few nouns, object words, that could be embedded and repeated and utilized within a family's everyday opportunities. So think about a child, and I see uh, Southwest ITC is right on this, so thank you guys for paying attention. Think about a child with whom you're currently working or the families with whom you're working, and consider some of the nouns or words that specify specific objects in that child's life that would be meaningful to that child. So if you haven't already, take about 30 seconds to talk amongst yourselves if you're in a group, and then to post a few of your ideas on the chat line. And as I said, Southwest folks are, have already included juice and shoes and ball, great words, mama for sure, dog, I see ball, cup, book, binky, doggy, milk, good, thanks Carrie. I like that Dana said Binky and then Corey mentioned Bubba and Sissy and I think these are really good examples too of things that are words that are specific to family members. So if you think of a pacifier, people have lots of different words for that. Binky, passy, um, I'm sure you guys, nook, I'm sure you guys can think of lots of other words for that. And the same with family members. Um, in my family, my son is calling my husband daddy, but I have a good friend who calls his dad poppy. So, and Bobette and Sissy and those sorts of things. So you really need to figure out, we really, as we do, as part of our role is to find out what words are important and meaningful within those families. And those are the nouns or the object words that we want to target. So you guys are right on this. I see cookie, dada, mama, cat, train, pet, car, airplane. Um, Corey says ours was Nin. I knew, Corey, you had a stranger. Not a strange, but a different name for your pacifier. Um, oh yeah, and Dana said I recently read the passy called the mute button. They actually have a pacifier that says on it mute, which is kind of hysterical when you see a baby with a pacifier and it says mute. You can imagine as an SLP how that's a little bothersome, but I totally get it too. Having a baby who had a little gas issue for a while there, sometimes you just want to plug that little mouth off. <laughs> Okay, great. And then um, Talisha and Sarah say ball, bubbles, drink, and snack. Good. So it can be a general word like snack, or you might even want to find out specifically what those snack items might be. So you guys are right on that. This is fantastic. Feel free to continue to bring those on as we move on to the next slide as well. Excuse me. Sorry about that with the cough. Okay. So here we've got relational words. Other words that we might want to target include non-noun words, which are considered relational because they express a relationship with the noun. These words tend to express a variety of meanings and might include verbs, adjectives, and even prepositions. We might also choose to include a few of these types of terms within a toddler's outcomes as well. And the reason for that is because if we're trying to eventually expand a child's ability to express a variety of intentions and to help a child eventually prepare for the transition to two to three word combinations, which is ultimately going to be our expectation or outcome, it's important to consider what words might go with those nouns, what relationships we might include to help those combinations come along later down the road. So relational words express a variety of meanings. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of a list here, but they might include action words. And action words are essentially verbs. So think of your typical verbs with young kids, eat, open, help. We also have descriptive words. And these include adjectives like hot and wet and dirty. Location terms such as up and in are also relational. Recurrence terms are words that express the reappearance of an object or repetition of an event. So one of our favorites, more, certainly fits that bill. Rejection and denial words might include the word no, and of course this is a great one. We teach it to provide the child with more control over his environment, and then inevitably the child figures out how to use the word no and use it well, and then the parents ask us how to get the child to stop using the word no. We also like to include non-existence or disappearance words or phrases like all done and all gone. And then finally, we often think of the word mine when considering a relational word of possession. So all of those words are words that we might want to consider within our outcomes because they'll eventually go um, along with our objects or our nouns in combination. 
And I see that you guys, Goochland is on it and RBHA, you guys are on it. You're already on to my second question. So one thing to keep in mind is that we do want to limit the number of target words within our outcomes. We want to be specific about which words we want to target first in order to ensure that the child is exposed to fewer words more frequently while reducing the demand on his or her language processing system. So with that in mind, when working with toddlers, I often focus on including two to three action words in addition to the handful of nouns that are included in the family's outcomes. So, and the reason for this is because action words or verbs tend to play an important role in that transition I talked about to short phrases and early sentences. After all, we can't simply combine a bunch of nouns to make a cohesive request or command. So following the lead of some of you who are right on this, um, let's take just a moment once again to brainstorm and come up with a few verbs that this time could be embedded and repeated and utilized within a family's everyday opportunities. So again, think about a child with whom you are currently working. Consider some of the verbs this time, action words that relate to routines or everyday activities in which a child participates and share those ideas on the chat line. I see lots of good examples, and I'm laughing that Corey here says she loves that Aggie, my niece, has her mouth open like a mama. I think I've taken so many pictures of saying that's my son in that picture. That's my niece. I've taken so many photos of people feeding him, and the adult always has their mouth open. And so here, my little five-year-old niece, she's six now, but five-year-old niece has her mouth wide open. I think we're just natural modelers, right? We like to show the infants and toddlers what to do. So while I've been talking, you guys have been doing a great job of up, of adding some words. Go, give me, up, mine, eat, drink, play, buy, down, great. So you guys definitely have the idea. Anything that a child may be interested in, might um, be participating in. So if you have an older toddler, maybe run, right, or maybe stop, I see in that same line. If you've got a child who's on the go, you might want to play stop and go. Help is a great one. Um, Eat, of course, bite, chew. Yeah, you know, I, one of my friends was just telling me um, whose son is a little bit delayed right now. He's almost two, um, and he's probably at about a 15 to 18 month level right now with his expressive language. But she was saying that he stuffs his mouth, and so she's always telling him to chew. So the other day, she said something about chewing to her husband, like, how are we going to teach him to chew? And he ran into the kitchen to get some food because he now thinks eat equals chew. Um, and so these kids are really listening and they're really paying attention. And so we want to make sure that we're um, embedding and incorporating words that are going to be meaningful to these kids. And these are certainly great examples of just that. Okay. So I think you guys have the idea. The bottom line is that for most young children, we should not be writing speech-specific outcomes or providing direct speech therapy under the age of three. Again, with the exception of those children who have a medical organic need for this direct intervention or for those children for whom we really are monitoring those red flags. We should, however, be considering outcomes that will address the child's language needs and we should be providing functional language therapy. For infants and toddlers within these language-based outcomes then, speech sound production can and should be embedded into our practice to ensure that their development of articulation and phonology is also stimulated, monitored, and is on target as expected. So we're not ignoring the speech, we're embedding the speech. Excuse me. Okay. So um, what might these outcomes actually look like? And I know that some folks have said that really providing simple, straightforward examples is helpful. So that's what I've tried to do here. Um, and what you'll see on the next three slides are actually um, pictures and examples of my son and my husband um, and other people who are involved in his life. And I tried to come up with um, some examples that we're actually incorporating. Now, my son is a year old. He turned a year about two weeks ago. And I am thrilled to be able to report that his speech and language are right on track at this stage in his development. And I will admit that yes, I've probably been obsessively monitoring it all since he was born. I'm not sure that we can help ourselves in this case. So I've still come up with a few outcomes that are specific to him and to our own family's routines. And so regardless of his development, each of these outcomes targets his functional language development at this point in his life and will provide my family with lots of opportunities to embed speech into our interactions in natural everyday ways. 
Okay, so every night, you can see on the screen here, it's my son and my husband. Every night, my husband, Jim, and I follow the same routine for bedtime with Augie. And I don't know if it, again, is my minor obsession with structure or the fact that my SLP ways are rubbing off on my husband, but we are fairly consistent with that bedtime process. So after playing in Augie's room for a few minutes, Jim will pick him up and lay him down on the changing table. He's getting a little squirmy these days, but he's still able to do that to change his diaper. As he removes Augie's soiled diaper, Jim will point to the plastic wipe warmer that we have and push the button on it that turns on the night light feature. So it's a little green light that comes on. Augie will crane his neck to see the light go on, and Jim will automatically say, light on. Once Augie's clean diaper is on, Jim will say, light off, and push the button again before picking Augie up and bringing him to his crib. Now after getting his pajamas on, which is an entire routine into itself, Jim will walk around the room with Augie and say good night to the birds, which are little vinyl adhesives. You can see kind of behind them. There's a little brown bird there in that picture of the tree behind them on the wall. Um, and the other animals um, in the prints on the walls. So Jim will say something like good night birds, tweet, 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 good night lion, rawr, rawr, and so on and so forth with each of the animal sounds. So using Robin McWilliams outcome format, which is what we already use in our Virginia EI outcomes, so all of you are already using these, you can see in this example on the screen that I created an outcome that takes into consideration the routine that we already have in place. So we're not creating a new routine or a new situation, we're using the one that we already have to focus on Augie's imitation and ultimately initiation of the words and phrases that are included in this routine every night with his daddy. So in the outcome itself, I've included the three components that we already include in our IFSP outcomes. So we've got the acquisition statement. Augie will say two word phrases. And then we have the context or everyday routine at bedtime with his dad or with daddy. And then the criterion or an indication of how we will know when this outcome is actually met. And we've chosen five nights a week for two weeks. So again, we feel like that's realistic, that over time, over the next six months, as he begins, his language begins to develop and he's listening to these um, phrases and statements and words that are repeated every night within these routines, that five nights out of those seven over two weeks, he's going to start imitating and then saying these phrases, light on, light off, birds tweet, lion roar, those sorts of things. So we're incorporating speech again into the language that we're hoping Augie acquires over the next six months. Okay, so <coughs> excuse me, here's another one for you. So in this picture, Augie also goes to daycare every day for about eight hours a day so that I can do things like this webinar. Um, while he's there, he takes two naps. I'm sure that's short-lived at this point, but currently he's still taking two naps. So he has several comfort items that we, his parents, have provided that the daycare providers then keep for him in his assigned crib. Before each of his naps, his primary provider, who's Sierra, you can see this on the screen, she's a good sport and let me take her photo the other day, she picks up at least one or two of the items from the crib and gives it to him before she prepares Augie for the nap itself. So this routine serves as a transition for Augie from play to nap time. And we do something similar at night as well. He now asks for one of his, um, one of his um, comfort items at home too. So this has become really important to him within his routines. Now Jim, his dad, has been naming all of Augie's toys, stuffed animals, and even comfort items since Augie was born. And I think he finds himself to be quite entertaining. So the names are quite entertaining as well. I kind of call them 1970s funk. Um, but the two items that we keep at daycare are called Darlene and Lamont. So you're seeing a picture of Lamont today. Lamont is the little cheetah blanket right there. So again, keeping this in mind when this outcome was created and coaching Sierra, the child care provider, to implement this interactive component into the daily routine that has already been established. Again, we haven't changed anything. Now we're just working on language based on the routine that we've already established. I again used Robin McWilliams outcome format in this example. So in this one, you can see the acquisition statement. Augie will ask for his comfort items by name. And then we've actually incorporated what those names are just to remind everyone this is specifically what we want him to ask for. We've also included the context or everyday routine, and in this case it's at daycare with his child care provider because that's where he is five days a week. 
And we'll know when the outcome is met when Augie meets this outcome in five rest periods over the course of a week. So really we're asking that this, we're, we're expecting that this outcome is met when he um, completes this acquisition at least once out of the two nap times each day. Or maybe he has a good day and does it both days and he has a tough day and he doesn't do it either day. <coughs> Excuse me. I want to take just a moment here to acknowledge that these names, Darlene and Lamont, are tough words for a toddler to produce. Now if I had really trained or coached my husband well, I should say coached in this, in this context, although as his wife, I like to say trained, um, I probably would have coached him and guided him to come up with some easier words. Um, but those are the words he chose. He's quite proud of those names. And so we are going to talk about how to embed these types of sounds in words in our play and in our targeted intervention in just a few minutes. So just hang in there and we'll come back to that soon. Okay. Um, here is our final example. So one more example of a functional outcome that will facilitate language development, but again can also easily allow my family to incorporate speech sound development into an everyday routine. Now like many early toddlers, young toddlers, my son is an, an eater. He just loves to eat and he's an extremely pushy eater. So if, if his mouth is not full of food, but there's food anywhere in sight, he's yelling or desperately signing more to get more food. So on occasion, we will have several different items that we're feeding him. And during those meals, he's clearly unhappy when, the, when we're giving him a choice, but you know, telling him what he's going to have in any particular bite. So ultimately, he now wants total control. So for example, if he has beans and toast, he'll always indicate a preference for the toast over the beans. So we want to work on getting him to ask for more of the specific food or drink that he actually wants, rather than just yelling or fussing. In this example, you can see that again, I've included that same McWilliam format to create this outcome. So the acquisition statement is that Augie will ask for more plus a food drink item. So ultimately our goal is that he'll verbalize, he'll say more plus water, more water, more toast, more banana. Uh, but for now we're also accepting the sign too because we're working on the language development. The context or everyday routine is then at mealtime with mommy. And then the criterion is since he eats at least five meals or snacks per day, but two or three of those are with me during the week, we've, his mom, we've determined that this outcome will be met when he is asking for more plus the food that he wants during one meal per day for two weeks. So again, this one is specific to involve me. So all of his primary caregivers, as you can see, are involved in these outcomes. His dad has a routine that's already in place at night. I tend to be the one who feeds him in the morning and the evenings. And so this one addresses um, the routines that we've already got established. And then also there's one at the child care center that Sierra can work on with him because she does the same routine that we've already established that's part of his daily interaction with her twice a day. And so all of these are embedded and sounds are embedded in the language that we're targeting. So with this perspective in mind then, it sounds easy, right? But in reality, we all know from working with our families that we can't just expect a child who has limited or no sounds or words to just simply start imitating us, simply because we want him or her to do so. If that was all it took, for many of us, our jobs would not even exist. So when I work with families, I always keep in mind a few key considerations. And these considerations, or as I'm calling them here, tips, tend to form the foundation by which I coach the parents and the caregivers on ways that they can embed speech sound development into their everyday routines and activities. Each of these tips is intended to help families embed speech sounds into play-based or routine-based language-rich activities while they are engaged with their children. So by now we're all aware of the fact that children need to be able to make sense of stimuli in order to learn from it. In order for a child to process information, it needs to be presented with a normal, naturally occurring event or opportunity in his or her own environment. Using flashcards to teach sounds or words or creating superficial teaching opportunities like pushing the child to imitate animal sounds is not going to work. Infants and toddlers truly do not learn or ultimately develop speech or language through artificial methods. Instead, their verbalizations, their language, should be based on models that we have provided within the natural routines and activities. These are the opportunities that will have meaning for and an impact on the learning by a child. 
Young children will naturally imitate the speech sounds that are embedded within the language that they can and want and even need to use within their everyday lives, even those who are struggling with their language. They do not, however, tend to imitate sounds that do not have a place within naturally occurring everyday activities and routines. So that's where we can really encourage and coach families to embed sounds in meaningful language. All right, so let's get on to these tips. So what are they? Well, let's go ahead and start with this one. <laughs> My first tip is to use something that we call self-talk. Self-talk is a running dialogue about your actions. So think of yourself as a cook on the food channel, and you're talking about everything that you're doing, mixing, pouring, cooking, tasting. So for example, you're making a snack for your child, and you want to address the use of the M sound and the P sound, primarily because the child's grandparents are coming to visit, and they like to be called Papa and Mama. In this scenario on the slide, my niece and my husband, the little girl's uncle, might say, I'm making pancakes. Hmm, I think I need to put more milk in the batter. So he can spend some time asking her then and talking about what needs to go in the batter, do we need more milk, what are we making, and the P, the M, and the B sounds can be stressed and repeated within the context of the words that are embedded in the activity itself. We also encourage the inclusion of the words in the caregiver's or parent's self-talk. So if they want to encourage the child's use of these sounds towards saying his or, his or her, in this case her grandparents' names, we want to encourage the parents to talk about Papa and Mama as well. So in this case, Uncle Jim might add, Papa and Mama are sure going to love these pancakes when they visit. Essentially, this strategy is all about encouraging the parents or caregivers to talk about what they're doing when they are around the child. They should be pairing their words with their actions. And this will actually help build the child's language the child's receptive language or understanding and comprehension of the words and their processing while actually targeting specific sounds at the same time. This strategy can be used in every setting. It may feel a little foreign at first and seem tough for the parents to come up with the words or sounds that are important to the families when you first encourage them to use self-talk. But with practice it will become much easier and more fun for the parents and for the child. And often families recognize that the children are responding. They're more engaged, they're more interactive, they might even begin to try to imitate some of the sounds in the words when they hear them within those contexts that make sense to them. So I'm going to give you all a sound again, um, and I want you to take a few minutes to come up with an activity in which a family might incorporate the sound into an activity in which they already engage. So remember, the goal is to model the sound and to use the sound in a word or words that are related to the activity. Okay, so the sound for all of you today is P or PA. So I want you to take a few minutes, if you're in a group, talk amongst yourselves, if not, maybe jot something down and then put on the chat what are some words that you can, in which you can model the sound P in an activity that's related to what the child might be interested in doing. So Dee is looking at the screen, I think, and she said PAN. So or I eat peas, good. So again, it doesn't have to be specific to this picture, but that certainly can be um, D. So thanks for getting this started. All right, lots of good examples coming up now. Push, pop, popcorn, popping, popping bubbles, pat the puppy, push, pour, pull, play. Good, look at pictures of Papa, absolutely. Looking at pictures with toddlers is a lot of fun because those have meaning as well. PJs at bedtime, yep. I see Patty put put, and you can use put with lots of things. Put your pajamas on, put your doll away, yeah, all kinds of things. Pee pee in the potty, yeah, if we're working on that, it's certainly important. I don't know about all of you who are parents, but I find that I often have to go pee pee whether my son is engaged or not. He's become very intrigued on what I'm doing. So now I'm always talking about when I'm peeing, even though he's not really ready to do that. But that's something that's also teaching him in a context. Pizza, play patty cake, good. You guys are definitely on the right track. So again, we want to know, and you can continue to keep these coming. They're great examples. We want to note that our actions and our utterances should be embedded within everyday routines and activities. So as you can see from my personal example of having to go to the bathroom at inopportune times, that's meaningful for my child, right? He thinks the toilet right now is a place to put little bouncy balls in. And so it's good that he's learning that there actually is a function to that bathroom. They, beyond washing hands, we go to the bathroom, we go pee-pee. And so it's going to have a learning impact on him within the context of that meaningful experience. 
and he might even be saying the word before he's ready to be potty trained, but it's going to help him with that process as well because, again, the language is going to have meaning in his life and what he's doing. You guys came up with some great examples. I see too that um, Sun Young said pizza, and we definitely have a Friday pizza night, so that is something else that I think, in my case, my son is going to be learning pretty quickly. Okay, let's look at the second tip. This is probably the simplest one to understand and the most difficult to apply day to day. So the idea behind waiting and seeing is to do just that. Wait and see what the child will do and say. Too many times we as adults pose question upon question to children, even infants and toddlers, and don't wait to allow them enough time to respond on their own. Children have a lot to say, but if we don't allow them the chance to process information and to speak, we limit their chances to practice and grow in their speech and language development. So this process of waiting and then seeing and then prompting allows us as adults to be patient when waiting for a child to respond to our questions or requests. A good rule of thumb is to wait between 5 to 10 seconds after asking a child a question or making a request. Now, that may not sound like very long, but wow, it really can feel like forever when you're just waiting. So let's all try this right now. I want everyone to go ahead, and when I say go, I want everybody to count silently to 5. And go. And that was really only 5 seconds. So keep in mind that each time you wait and allow a child time to think and process about what they want to say or do, you're letting that child know that you care about what they have to say. You're also promoting a better conversation. So here's an example. You ask a child the question, where is your car going while playing with race cars? And then wait for at least five seconds before either repeating your question or jumping back into the conversation. You have literally just allowed the child time to attend to the actions in which they are involved and to consider what you are contributing as well. So you've provided that child with time to process the information that they've heard and they may later use themselves. So often we do see sort of that delayed reaction, but children need to take time to process information, make sense of it before they truly will use it. Okay, talk about what the child is doing. This is actually called parallel talk in the SLP world, and this process is very similar to self-talk, but this time you're giving a running commentary about what the child is doing or saying. So consider yourself this time the sports announcer, describing each action your child is engaging in. So for example, if the child is playing with toy cars, while he's pushing, you might say, oh, Joey is playing with his cars. Joey, you are pushing the car, P -p 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 push, push the red car. Oh no, it crashed into the purple truck. Oops. So again, in this case, the idea is to let the child know how important what he is doing is and to embed sounds like the P in this example into the commentary that you provide to promote the child's verbalizations, no matter where he is or what he's doing. Self-talk and parallel talk go together very well. You may even find yourself using both of these strategies within the same routine and activity, and that's great. The more you can coach the caregivers and parents to include in their everyday routines and activities with the child, the better. <coughs> coach your families to make some time, to make their time with the child all about the child by talking about what the child is doing and saying. Let the child know how important what he is doing or saying really is. As I've mentioned before, consider how focusing attention on the child and the child's focus is going to have the biggest impact on his or her learning and development in regard to speech and language versus flashcards or creating artificial teaching opportunities. I think it's important too here to say that we really don't need to spend a lot of time or all of our time playing with the child and that's why these routines and everyday opportunities are so important snack times and nap times and getting dressed in the morning and going to the bathroom. These are the opportunities to embed speech and language. We don't have to get down on the floor and play with that child every day for our interactions and our language to be meaningful. So even though I'm giving you some examples of play, it really has to be about what's going to work for the family and what's going to be natural for them. <coughs> I apologize for the coughing, everybody. I'm going to try to keep it at bay here. Okay, so number four. This step is all about modeling and possibly embedding some natural prompts to encourage the child to imitate sounds and words as well. 
Modeling is something that many parents and caregivers are already doing. They just may not realize how effectively they're already doing it. And the same goes for many of you as service providers. You're probably doing a fantastic job of modeling. And to recognize how important that is, is a great thing. So children learn well through imitation and modeling. Um, and it's all about demonstration and the expectation of imitation. So think of this as another way of teaching the child. The key idea is to say what you want your child to do before you expect him or her to do it. So we can use modeling in a variety of ways. We might model how a certain word sounds that the child is having difficulty saying. Or we might model what to say when a child is asking for something. Sometimes we might even want to naturally embed a prompt for the child to imitate the model. If you have the child's attention based on all of the self-talk and parallel talk that you've been doing, you can even begin to prompt him to imitate. You'll want to prompt a young child in as natural a way possible though. So again, you're providing a model and you want the exchange to be embedded within an everyday conversation or turn-taking routine. I always tell my students when I'm teaching um, here at Radford University to avoid say or to tell the child you say, um, you know, you say truck, you say go. Instead, I encourage them to prompt with, tell me, tell me more, or show me help, or by providing the model of the sound or word before asking a direct question. So for example, if you're spending time with a grandmother here in this picture who's making cookies with her grandchild, you might coach her to model to say something like, we are making cookies. What are we making? If the child does not respond, you can wait five seconds, remember to let that child process, and then that grandmother can prompt her again with cookies. Yum, tell me cookies. So again, you're providing her with the model before even asking her the question or prompting her to repeat it. Another example during a shared experience might be, I need a spoon. What do you need? And so you've given her the word, the, the target that you're actually asking her to use in the response before you even ask the question. And if necessary, then you can prompt the child to say, tell me spoon, while holding the spoon up in front of the child. So this is not a situation where you're trying to trick the child or test the child. You're really trying to give them as much language modeling as possible. All right, and number five, um, you've waited to see what the child wants to do and what she has to say. You've commented through parallel talk about what she's doing. Now imitate the child. Follow her lead. Do what she does. If she plays with a toy, imitate her actions. If she does any pretend play, do the same pretend play that she's doing. Coach the parents and caregivers to do the same throughout the day whenever it's possible, whenever it's feasible. The purpose is to get the child's attention so that he or she realizes that you believe what she's doing is important. If she makes any sounds, imitate those. If the child uses any word approximations or words, say them too. Once you have her attention, continue to imitate the child's actions, gestures, signs, and sounds, but then expand on them a bit. So if the child signs, imitate the sign and then expand on it by verbalizing the word. And again, you're probably already doing this, but always first remember to imitate the sign so that she or he knows that what she did has meaning, that you're responding to what um, the child's intent is, and then you're expanding on it to give the child the verbal word as well before giving the desired object or action to the child. So you're ultimately creating a turn-taking routine, a conversation within the context of expanding. If she makes a sound, any sound, imitate it and then expand on it, again with either a reduplication where you repeat the sound multiple times or an expansion of it into a word. So you might turn the raspberry sound into a funny repeated sound with a silly expression on your face. You might imitate a car sound multiple times and then say go. So my son now, when he's playing with a little car, will say an approximation of boom, boom, boom. And so I always say, he says boom, boom, and I say, that's right, the car says boom, 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 go. So he's hearing the language that goes along with that sound. So I'm not trying to get him to stop making those silly sounds. I'm just trying to embed those sounds into meaningful language. If the child simply engages in a play action, again, imitate it and then expand on the play. So if a child stirs a pot, you stir a pot. And then you smell it and say, mmm. Let that child know that there's some sounds and words that go along with the actions. So what about recasting then? We've just talked about expanding. Recasting is a strategy used to correct a child's speech and language gently. So children do well when provided with feedback on how to correctly say a certain sound, word, or even phrase, but it's important to provide the feedback in a gentle, embedded manner. And that's what recasting is all about. 
So with this strategy, you're providing a correct speech example for the child in a gentle way that encourages him or her to continue to communicate while learning and developing speech sound productions. So for example, if the child says, I want to pay instead of play, you might respond with, oh, you want to play? Yeah, let's play. The accurate sound productions have been restated or recast so that the child hears the correct form, but the correction is provided in a natural and positive way. So you wouldn't want to say, no, 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 try again. I didn't hear that L. Play. Try that again with the L sound. By directly correcting a child like this who's still developing those sounds, we might inadvertently halt the learning process, stop the conversation, or even take the fun out of communicating. So you might have recognized that when we recast, we're also inadvertently expanding. So let's try a practice run of these processes. So get your typing fingers ready again here. Um, if you are engaged with a child in a craft activity, just like the photo on the slide, you provide the child with a choice between tape and glue. You ask the child to tell you which one she wants, and she responds with do for glue, so with a D instead of the GL. How might you respond to recast and expand on the child's verbalization? So again, if you're in a group, take a few seconds to talk amongst the group, and go ahead and type it in if you're on your own. Give us an example. If I say to a child, do you want tape or glue, and the child says do, how might you recast to gently correct the child and then expand on that response? Good, Kim has gotten us started right away. You want glue. Good, so she's including the word in, in the correct context and also expanding it. Oh, Jennifer, I like how you even added an adjective in there. Oh, you, you want the glue, sticky glue. Want glue, here's glue. Let's use the glue, great. Great examples. Just waiting a second to see. Oh, good. I like how Prince William is so um, confirming. I'd pick glue, too. <laughs> That's a great choice you've picked. But I love how you're all, in your examples, many of you have said the word glue now several times. So you're providing lots of models. You're giving them the glue. Then you're talking about the glue. So you're incorporating all five of these strategies, really, in this one opportunity. Fantastic. <coughs> okay. Just one more quick, although I think related, side story for you. This again is another picture of my son. I just can't stop myself. Um, and this is a story about him. But I was just thinking about this the other day. He was looking at a book, and he's just become interested in books in the last couple of weeks, a little bit more independently, in his car seat while we were driving him to daycare one morning. I was sitting in the passenger seat in the front not while my husband was driving. So I kept looking back at him, at him and telling him, just like we've been talking about with these different strategies, Augie, you're looking at a book. It's a book. You have a book. And every sort of in a sing-song way, every few, I should say minutes, but every few seconds, I turn around and say, how's the book? I love your book. And he was getting pretty excited because I was acknowledging, even though he was back there, you know, facing the back with his little mirror, that um, he was being acknowledged for what he was doing, what his experience was in that moment. Much to my surprise, after doing this probably, I don't know, we only have a five-minute drive to daycare, but I probably said the word book in context and pointing to the book that he had 12 or 15 times. He actually imitated me, although his version was gook with a G. Gook, gook. So I immediately jumped into my SLP mode, and I responded with, ba, 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 book. So he gave me this big smile, and what do you think he said? Go, 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 gook, and clapped his hands as if to say, nailed it, mama. So what was the lesson learned? First of all, I looked over at my husband. He was thrilled that he was imitating, but rolled his eyes immediately at me because I was doing the speechy thing. But what the lesson that was really learned was that he was imitating and learning the language, right, in the context of what he was experiencing. But developmentally, even though he's doing other words with ba, he's, he says ball all the time, word for approximation for ball all the time, ba, ba, ba. He's not ready to produce those sounds in that word correctly yet. That ka at the end of the word makes it hard for him to do a ba at the beginning. So he backs it to ga, gook. But, so that's great. I mean, he, I love that he's using the guz and the cuz, but he's not going to imitate the correct speech sounds simply because I, in, I modeled them for him, because I pushed those. Those sounds, the ba 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 book in isolation, have no relevance to my son, this one-year-old, outside of the naturally occurring activity in which he's already engaged. So to him, 
he knows that a book is gook. He knows that a gook is book. When he says gook, I know it's time to read at night for him now. But he, and he will eventually get book because he is saying that bus sound in other contexts. But some of you asked at the very beginning of this session, what do we, you know, some parents want us to target those things. And I think that this is the lesson that was learned for me as a mom as well as an SLP, that the sounds in isolation have no relevance, have no meaning to an infant or a toddler outside of the naturally occurring activities in which they're already engaged. So we can do some self-talk and parallel talk and model and expand and recast, but they're, they're, these kids are not going to imitate those sounds unless they have meaning within the words. And so he will eventually, because we use the word book all the time, he will get that word. He will get those sounds in those words. But not until he's really ready to do that in the next you know, three to six to nine months. Um, and so that has to come to him. That processing has to occur to him. So now I want to hear from you. Today we've briefly reviewed assessment and diagnostic considerations related to our tick and phonology. And again, I want to remind you that you're welcome to go back to the webinar in March to get more information about that and to the blogs. We've discussed what is and is not appropriate in regard to outcomes and the best ways to incorporate speech sound development within our outcomes with families. I also presented those five strategies to facilitate appropriate and natural speech sound development within everyday activities and routines. So with all of this in mind, why are the strategies that I just presented going to be more effective than targeting specific animal and environmental sounds, or teaching a child to produce sounds with flashcards, or out of the context of natural interactions, in promoting and encouraging functional communication when you're coaching your families? So take just a few seconds, a minute, to jot down a few ideas or to talk to the group if you're within a group right now, and then share your ideas with us. Why are these strategies going to be more functional for communication with your families and targeting specific sounds and outcomes? Okay, I see a couple of answers coming up. I'm just going to wait a few more seconds as people type in their answers. Great. I think you guys can read these as well, but um, I'll just go over a few of them. They facilitate parent interaction. They have meaning and relevance to the child's everyday activities and interactions. They're contextual, so they don't take prior planning. They're spontaneous and fun. I think that's huge for families, right? They should be embedded into what they're already doing. And then as Dana said, because of that, they lead to more frequent practice because they are meaningful. They fit with what's already going on in their everyday activities. They promote organic conversations. You're not introducing anything made up. Right, all of these things are functional and meaningful and contextual. So I think when we talk with families about outcomes, obviously we all know that the outcomes are family focused, right? Families are coming up with these with us. We're not telling them what the outcomes should be. But I do think it's our one of our roles is to coach the families when we're talking about outcomes and talking about what is going to help them have meaning and relevance and be spontaneous for the families. What is going to promote and lead to more frequent practice because they're already doing it. I think sometimes when we provide information to families to let them know you're already doing this, we just want you to know how meaningful it is, that makes the biggest difference. And the meaning behind those things is going to have the impact on the child that we really need it and want it to have. Okay, so just as I consistently share with the parents and caregivers with whom I work on a daily basis, you are each a crucial part of this process. Don't ever underestimate the role that you as service providers take on when you walk into a home and begin to build that relationship with a family. We know that we play a part in ensuring that each child with whom we interact is going to grow, is going to learn, and is going to change. And as we arm ourselves with knowledge, therefore, we can expand the opportunities that we have to share information and coach the caregivers to, to work most effectively with their own children. So I challenge all of you to continue to challenge yourselves to do just that. 
Okay, as we wrap up today, it's now up to you. So before you begin to pack up and head out to see your families, I know you all have a probably a full caseload this afternoon, I want you to jot down three things that you learned in today's webinar. I also want you to consider at least two strategies that you've learned today to put into practice with the families with whom you're currently working. And finally, we would love to hear from you directly, so jot down one idea that you want to learn more about in the near future, and send that idea to the folks, Corey and Dana, at the Integrated Training Collaborative Professional Development Team. I know they want to hear from you. They want to hear what's important to you. So I've definitely talked enough. I know we only have about a minute left. I want to remind you that the March webinar and the subsequent blog posts are still available for your review, so be sure to go back and watch that webinar if you have questions. Feel free to contact me, go through the blogs and ask questions. We have a few minutes for me to answer any questions that you may have, or maybe a minute. Um, so I'm going to turn it back over to Corey. I don't think I've missed any, but if you have any questions now, or you can contact me. Here's my contact information. Um, with any questions or concerns, I'm always happy to respond to your questions via email or pick up the phone and give me a call. It's kind of old school, but it's nice to have a conversation as well. So thank you all for participating today. And again, I'll stay on the line for a few minutes if there are any questions that I can field. Well, thank you so much, Corey. You did not miss any questions as we went, so I appreciate you keeping up with the, with the chat as we went along. Um, Again, as Corey acknowledged, she would be happy if you have questions, you want to contact her, please don't hesitate um, to do that. Jeannie has also put in the um, chat box the um, March Talks on Tuesday. We've given the link to the blogs. Um, this is a new way we've been trying the Talks on Tuesday with some activities. First um, webinar, then some blogs, and then a second webinar. So we'd love to have your feedback if you participated in all of those activities. So thank you all for joining us. It is 1 o'clock, and I want to honor your time. So I hope everybody has a great afternoon. And Corinne, thank you again for sharing your expertise with all of us. Okay. Bye, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye.